Okay, I want to talk today about um, Bertrand Russell's A History of Western Philosophy. I just want to say a few words about it. A History of Western Philosophy. It's one of the great, it's probably the, the most famous uh, history of philosophy in the 20th century. Bertrand Russell is a great writer. Um, if you've never read it, um, it's a book you should read. Bertrand Russell. Um, this was written in 1945, copyright 1945, Bertrand Russell, at the end of World War II. Um, let me go over briefly what he talks about in it. He talks, he begins with the pre-Socratics. Pre-Socratic philosophers, you know, be, these are the ones before, before Plato and er, before Socrates, pre-Socratics. He has a chapter on um, the Milesian school, which would be Thales, who's considered the first philosopher. Thales is a guy that said all is water. Everything is water. The principle, the, everything is made out of water. That may sound it's kind of strange, but it's not. it was the first scientific hypothesis ever made by Thales. Thales is, this is around 585 BC. He flourished, so around 600 BC, 585 BC. So Russell begins talking about the uh, Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes. These are the Milesian school. Um, then Pythagoras. He has a chapter on Heraclitus, Parmenides. Parmenides is a guy that said all is one. He had a very big influence on Plato. He has a chapter on Empedocles, a chapter on Athens in relation to culture, a chapter on... Um, Anaxagoras, chapter on the Atomus, chapter on Protagoras. That's in part one. Then part two is Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So he has several chapters in each of those. Then ancient philosophy deals with Hellenistic world, the Cynics, Skeptics, Epicureans, Stoicism, the Roman Empire, Plotinus. He has a chapter on the religious development of the Jews, um, chapter part, uh, this is book two. Chapter two is Christianity during the first four centuries. Chapter three of part two, or I mean of book two, is the doctors of the church. Ch um, chapter four is St. Augustine's philosophy and theology. Uh, then he has a chapter on the fifth and sixth centuries, chapter on St. Benedict and Gregory the Great. I mean, he has a whole lot. I'm not going to go through everything. He has a chapter on modern philosophy, beginning on Hume, Spinoza, Leibniz, Descartes. It's a, about 850 pages. And um, so if you've never read it, it's a, I suggest you do read it, especially if you're interested in intellectual history. It, or if you're interested in philosophy, you definitely should read it. But even if you're just interested in uh, the history of our culture, if you've never read the history of Western philosophy, Bertrand Russell, um, I suggest that you do read it. The in the let me give you a sense of uh, how of how he writes. I mean, here's how he begins. He's a beautiful writer. Here's how the first paragraph of the introductory chapter. The conceptions of life and the world, which we call philosophical, are a product of two factors. One, inherited religious and ethical conceptions. The other, this, this sort of investigation, which may be called scientific using this word in its broadest sense. Individual philosophers have differed widely in regard to the proportions in which these two factors entered into their systems, but it is the presence of both in some degree that characterize philosophy. So philosophy is characterized by combining two different interests. One the inherited religious and ethical conceptions of our culture, 
and the second is scientific. So philosophy is philosophia, the, the, the etymology means the love of wisdom. So philosophy is more than simply abstract, you know, thought on abstract issues. It encompasses uh, an investigation into religious and ethical concerns, but also from a scientific, uh, critical uh, uh, perspective. He says, philosophy is a word which has been used in many ways, some which, some uh, n wider, some narrower. I propose to use it in a very wide sense, which I will try to explain. And then he gives his definition of philosophy. So let me, let me just go over this. That's very important. Philosophy, as I understand the word, it's, you know, it's very important when you're, when you explain anything to tell the reader what you mean by the words you're using. So Russell tells you from the very beginning how he's using the word philosophy. Philosophy, as I shall understand the word, is something intermediate between theology and science. On the one hand you have theology, on the other hand you have science, and then in the middle you have what he calls philosophy. Okay, it has similarities with both and differences. Okay, like theology, so philosophy is like theology in one sense. It consists of speculations and matters to which definite knowledge has so far been unascertainable. Okay, theology uh, deals with things that science cannot give you definite answers to. So sort of philosophy deals with those subjects too. Like, but like science, it appeals to human reason rather than to authority. So philosophy is like theology in that it deals with subjects on which no definite knowledge is possible. That would be science. But it only appeals to reason, not to authority, not to revelation. So it only appeals to reason. Or, uh, yeah, to reason. Um, but like science, it appeals to human reason rather than to authority, whether that of tradition or that of revelation. Now, all definite knowledge, so I should contend, Russell says, belongs to science. All dogma as to what surpasses definite knowledge belongs to theology. So, all definite knowledge to science all dogma as to what we cannot know with certainty belongs to theology. All dogma as to what surpasses definite knowledge belongs to theology. In, but between theology and science, there is a no man's land exposed to attack from both sides. This no man's land is philosophy. So that's how we defines philosophy as a no man's land between science on the one hand and and theology on the other. Almost all the questions, so for example, questions about quantum physics, magnetism, you know, the Big Bang, the galaxies, these are all scientific questions because we have means of answering the questions through empirical research. Questions about God and uh, heaven, hell. These things science cannot touch. And reason cannot answer the questions, but religion gives dogmatic answers to. That's theology. Science is in between the two. It deals with, like science, it only appeals to reason. But like theology, it deals to questions that reason cannot give you definite answers to. That's why he calls it a no man's land. Almost all the questions, Russell says, of most interest to speculative minds are such as science cannot answer. And the confident answers of theologians no longer seem so convincing as they did in former centuries. And here's some examples of the questions that philosophy deals with. That science cannot answer and that, Russell says, we no longer take the 
theological theology, we don't look to theology as giving us definite answers, authoritative answers. So what are some of these questions that are so important that philosophy deals with, that science cannot answer, and that religion does not give us good answers to either? Is the world divided into mind and matter? And if so, what is mind and what is matter? Okay, these are philosophical questions. Is mind subject to matter or is it possessed of independent powers? Has the universe any unity or purpose? Is it evolving towards some goal? These are questions we ask as human beings, but science cannot answer. Are there really laws of nature or do we believe in them only because of our innate love of order? Is man what he seems to the astronomer, a tiny lump of impure carbon in water, impotently crawling on a small and unimportant planet? Or is he what he appears to Hamlet? Is he perhaps both at once? Is there a way of living that is noble and another that is base? Or are all ways of living merely futile? If there is a way of living that is noble, then what does it consist? And how shall we achieve it? Must the good be eternal in order to deserve to be valued? Or is it worth seeking even if the universe is inexorably moving towards death? These are all philosophical questions that, are, we, that philosophy is concerned with answering. Is there such a thing as wisdom, or is what seems such merely the ultimate refinement of folly? Then Russell says, to such questions, no answer can be found in the laboratory. Theologies of professed to give answers all too definite, but their definiteness causes modern minds to view them with suspicion. The studying of these questions, if not the answering of them, is the business of philosophy. Why then, he says, you may ask, waste time on such insoluble problems? To this one may answer as a historian or as an individual facing the terror of cosmic loneliness. So what's the answer of the historian? The answer of the historian, as far as I am capable of giving it, will appear in the course of this work. Ever since men became capable of free speculation, their actions in innumerable important respects have depended up upon their theories as to the world and human life. The very way we act in the world depends upon how we think about the world. So that's the historical perspective. Then there's also the more personal answer. Science tells us what we can know, but what we can know is very little. And if we forget how much we cannot know, we become insensitive to many things of very great importance. Theology, on the other hand, induces a dogmatic belief that we have knowledge, where in fact we have, we have ignorance. And by, so doing, and by doing so generates a kind of impertinent insolence towards the universe. Then Russell says, uncertainty in the presence of vivid hopes and fears is painful but must be endured if we wish to live without the support of comforting fairy tales. Anyway, this is the beginning of Russell's history of Western philosophy. I just I read a little from the very first page, first two pages. So, if you've never read the history of Western philosophy, um, it's a great book to read. The last philosopher he deals with is, well, he deals with logical analysis, and he, John Dewey is the last chapter dedicated to, uh, to a particular philosophy. And before John Dewey, he talked about William James, and then he has a chapter on Marx, Karl Marx, Bergson, and so on. Chapter on Nietzsche, chapter on Hegel. Hunt. So it's a great book to read, uh, History of Western Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. I'll do a lot more of these videos talking about different um, books I'm interested in. And so if you're interested in 
tune into my channel. Talk to you later.